Hello students, in this video we'll prove the Bohr-Mollerup theorem. The Bohr-Mollerup theorem helps us classify when a function is actually the gamma function. What does it state? It states, suppose that f maps 0 plus infinity into 0 plus infinity has the following three properties. Property one is that f of one is equal to one. Okay, that's easy enough to understand. Property two is that f of x plus one is equal to x, f of x for all x greater than zero. That's a very similar, that we know the gamma function satisfies this property. And then three is that the log of f of x is convex. Then, then the function f has to be the gamma function. Beautiful. Okay, so how does the proof go? Well, the proof starts as follows. So here's the proof. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to say, since I can apply two over and over and over again, applying two, yields that f of x plus n for any uh, natural number n is going to be x times x plus 1 times all the way down to x to the x plus n minus 1 times f of x. And since this is true, this tells me that it suffices to prove that f of x is equal to gamma, so it suffices to prove that f of x is gamma of x for x between 0 and 1. And I can actually put equals 1 here because I know that f of 1 is equal to gamma of 1 by this property number 1. Cool, okay? All right, so one is easy. And so now what's the next thing to notice? Observe. What should we note? Property two implies, so property two, two implies that f of m is equal to m minus 1 factorial for m in n, right? In other words, this is exactly the factorial property. If I plug it in, if I plug in like 3, for example, this would be f of 4 is going to be, what? Well, it's going to be 3 times f of 2, which is 3 times 2 times f of 1, which is 3 times 2 times 1, so it's m factorial, right? So this property number 2 implies that on the natural numbers, this function is the factorial function, okay? That's going to be important. And so now, what we're going to do is we're going to use log convexity. So 3 implies what? implies that the log of f of n minus the log of f of n minus 1 over n minus n minus 1 is less than or equal to the log f x plus n minus the log f of n over x plus n minus n is less than or equal to the log f n plus 1 minus the log of what? Minus the log of f of n over n plus 1 minus n. Okay? That's log convexity, right? That's the definition of log convexity. And so now I can do the following. So now I'm going to plug in this function over here. I'm going to plug in just the natural number m, right? So I'm going to assume that n is an n, right? And if we do that, what are we going to have over here? We're going to have the log of f of just n factorial of just n minus 1 factorial minus the log of f n minus 2. This, of course, is just 1, is less than or equal to, this is going to be a 1 over x, the log f x plus n. I can't do anything over there, but I can write this as minus the log of n minus 1 factorial, less than or equal to, that's going to be the log of n factorial minus the log of n minus 1 factorial. And these are, can be, we can simplify these things over here, right? So this thing over here is exactly just going to be the log of n, and this thing over here is just going to be what? This is going to be the log 
of n minus 1, right? And so then hit both sides with an x and then add n log of n plus 1 factorial. So this, is tell, this tells me the following. This tells me that the log of n minus 1 factorial um, plus the log of n minus 1 to the power x is less than or equal to f of x plus n, less than or equal to the log of this, the log of that, and then less than or equal to what? Less than or equal to log n minus 1 factorial plus log of n to the power x. Great. Now I use this property over here so that I can divide by this little expression over here. So this tells me that then exponentiate, if we exponentiate, we get what? We get n, mi n minus 1 to the x, n minus 1 factorial, divided by, divided by this expression over here, x times x plus 1, all the way down to x plus n minus 1, like that, is less than or equal to f of x, is less than or equal to what? Is less than or equal to just an n to the x, n to the x, and then n minus 1 factorial, over x times x plus 1, all the way down to x plus n minus 1. And what we're going to do over here is we're going to make a, little, a small trick over here. What we're going to do is the following. I'm going to put an n on top, an n on the bottom, an x plus n on the bottom, and an x plus n on the top. Okay. And then what does this become? Well, the right-hand side then becomes what? It becomes x to the n, n factorial, over x, all the way down to what? All the way down to x plus n. Good! That reminds us of the Gauss formula. And what can we do over here? There's no n's over here. No n. There's no n's over here, which means I can, this is valid for all values of n. In particular, I can choose n to be n plus 1 and turn all these negative 1s into what? So all these negative 1s will vanish if I shift the index over here, and that's what we have on the right-hand side. Now I can let n go to infinity, right? As n goes to infinity, what's going to happen? As n goes to infinity for a fixed x, this expression tends to 1. And then by the Gauss formula, as n tends to infinity, we see that gamma of x Gauss formula is exact over here, is less than or equal to f of x, less than or equal to gamma of x, times something that's approaching 1. That proves that f of x is gamma of x. Great. Now, why is the bohr mahler theorem important? The bohr mahler theorem is important because, recall, what did we have originally? We had this formula for gamma. Gamma of z was e to the negative gamma of z over z, the product, n bigger than or equal to 1, of 1 plus uh, 1 plus z over n to the negative 1, e to the z over n. That was our formula for gamma, our infinite Weierstrass product for gamma. This tells me now that we know from differential equations when we studied the gamma function originally, I know that I have a formula for gamma on the real line. By analytic continuation, I can therefore write down the formula for gamma in general, right? This has to be equal to the integral from 0 to infinity, whenever this integral exists, t to the z minus 1, e to the negative z, e to the negative t, rather, not z, of course, so that's going to be a t, not a z, t, e to the negative t, dt, is also equal to the gamma function. So this formula over here and this formula over here give me the same thing. This is going to allow me to get nice formulations of the gamma function in terms of either an integral representation or an infinite product representation. I'm going to use both these things when we begin our discussion of the Raymond zeta function. Thank you very much.